Hi guys and welcome to the Smegcast from Red Dwarf TV. This is episode 12 and we are talking about Time Wave. In this episode, a ship from the 23rd century is washed up from the past and the Dwarfers run into a crew where criticism is illegal and one has to wonder how Rimmer will cope. So, I have with me today Matt. Hello. And Rachel. Hello. Right, starting with you Matt, because I'm just picking on you randomly. What did you think of the episode? (laughs) It was different, definitely. I I I did like it, especially the the references to um, 1970s BBC. (laughs) <laughs> I think those drew a bit of criticism, ironically, themselves. Yes, definitely. How about you, Rachel? What was your first impression? Pink. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's very pink, which is good. Um, yeah, the sort of same as Matt said, um, the BBC reference was uh, <laughs> very brave. <laughs> Put it that way. Um, yeah. Yeah, because we had a Murdoch reference in um, Cured, and then we've had a yeah a slightly controversial BBC reference in in this one. Um, and yeah, it was it was a different episode. That seems to be a lot of the thinking people have. It was very colourful. It was extremely yeah, so. <laughs> slightly bordering on garish, should we say. Yeah, it was it was it was quite a bizarre one, and it had some had some moments in it that were pure genius but it has uh, received a lot of criticism and on that note what do you think is a uh, a good point and a bad point about this one um good i love they, well like with any any episode of red dwarf that's coming out at the moment the the jokes that were that, that were conveyed um were brilliant um which you can't say for every series. Um, bad points. I think even though they're trying to get across that this is a ship where criticism isn't allowed, they've taken it maybe slightly too far overboard with the costumes. Too kind of caricatured. Yeah, I wasn't. I wasn't sure whether it was possible to uh, outdo Cat on a costume. Um, <laughs> could be wrong. Yeah, a little bit kind of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy Gone Mad, almost. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it was. I did, I did find it a bit over the top. If, even if you're not allowed criticism, they seem to be kind of schizophrenic. I think they were going for kind of a, uh, a, a sort of psychedelia kind of look with it really yeah. with all the yeah. colors and stuff but it, it was a it was a difficult one to convey because they were trying to parody i think the kind of almost 60s hippie kind of movement but with the 70s psychedelic kind of style but yeah it does come across quite pantomime were you on the same page of that rach yeah yeah um i, I totally agree with you there it was it was very sort of Yeah, the right, the right word. Um, yeah, it, like you said, it's pantomime. Yeah, it, it was rather, rather that as well. Um, that's probably the only over-the-top bad thing in that sense for me. Um, I think personally, that kind of takes the believability away from it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, as a goth, I felt very underrepresented. It, it too much. Yeah, I think I think for me, I was like, well. My my mode of expression is mostly wearing black. Where were the goths? There are no goths in space because that's very disappointing to me. You know, normal. Yeah. Everybody had something garish on, or pink, or yellow, or neon, or something like that. Um, it, it was like something out of Alice in Wonderland. Mm, yeah. Which very, obviously yeah. has the same psychedelic kind of. Um, yeah. source for its inspiration do you know I'm just thinking now as we're talking all the police were wearing uniform why didn't the policemen just not wear their uniforms because nobody could tell them off exactly mm. like he said himself later you know I can do what, whatever I like no one can criticise me yeah. Yeah. yeah so wear something normal yeah they could have <laughs> worn anything Hmm. some kind of adhering to the rules going on within the police force there um, maybe they chose that job because they liked uniform. 
something they could have explored maybe yeah Mm. have you got a favorite moment because there were some really good gems in this one as well as the the slightly weird overall feel um yeah there's a there's a couple really um just seeing seeing him in his his pink policeman's uniform was (laughs) was absolutely fantastic that johnny vegas i'm assuming yeah and uh i mean i do have to say at the start the very first joke you hear um I'll, I'll not do spoilers for anybody who hasn't seen it, but um, the very first joke you hear about uh, the planet that Rimmer is naming. <laughs> uh, that, uh, that's in the trailers. It's uh, yeah, it's full, full, okay. full of gas. Rimmer, so full of gas. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just absolutely original red dwarf, exactly where it came from, and it's you know, it's it's it's, it's what you're looking for. It's what you're waiting for, really. Yeah, yeah. Um, that that was good. Obviously, the the jokes are uh, good. Uh, perhaps when it went all mis- mishmash in the middle, um, <laughs> throwing bits of pink everywhere and crazy stuff. Um, I liked. Um, oh gosh. Oh, what's it called? What? Um, inner, um, that. Oh, it was inner. Inner critic. Ah! I've lost my words. Never mind. Go back. Is it the, are you going for the inner critic? Yes, that's what I'm going for. Ah. Yeah. But... <laughs> Getting my hands all around each other. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, I thought, I thought that was the, uh, pretty good. And then, you know, um, yeah. I think for I me, like, there I were like, a I couple... I like the way that he could defeat his inner critic himself by criticising the critic. Yes, a kind of cyclic nature of lifestyle thing. They did hint it might come back again, though. Yes. Crichton kind of hints that it, it might just be wounded, which sort of makes you wonder where it's gone if it's not gone back into his head. A little bit confidence maybe and paranoia. Have a with it later. Yeah, like maybe it's followed them back to the ship, or it will take over the take over the other ship and come after them and, and turn it into a ship of criticism. That might be quite a good a good turnaround for it. Not bound to Rimmer because it is his. <laughs> Like a, like a ghost, it, it follows him round because it haunts him. No, oh, the ghost of his past. We're getting very meta existential uh, yes. there. <laughs> <laughs> I think some of my favourite moments were, um, oh, what's the actor's name? Uh, Joe Sims. He was the guy that tuts. I thought that the comic <laughs> timing on that, where he was just kind of like, I won't do it again. I won't do it again. And then immediate, oh, it just. I liked. I think those are some of the bits I like the best. Just them in the cell, and and him explaining. Take me with you. I promise I won't touch again. <laughs> and they we- <coughs> but wheeling him in like he's Hannibal Lecter. Yeah. And just and he's the most normal guy there. I think that's that's the bit that did work for me was that the guy who's their most wanted terrible criminal is a completely normal fine guy who you'd love to hang around with. He just occasionally tuts yeah. when he can't get his lunch or something and i did i did quite enjoy the the contrast of that so that was quite, quite to- a similar tone to uh, all of the episodes in series 12 the if you look from the right direction there's, there seems to be some kind of un- underlying message behind each of the episodes Ooh, you think red dwarf's gone well, like morality message yeah i mean if, if you look at um the uh, episode two cured. Yeah. Um, this, you know, the underlying. Oh, what was it? Um, we we came to that last time we reviewed when we reviewed it. I can't remember exactly what it was. Um, and now here we've got, you know, uh, the most sane person on the ship is the one that everybody else locks up. Yeah. There yeah, is. It does seem to be a a recurring theme that they are going for contrast of extremes definitely mm. I think I try to think my other fav- favourite moments were um, get the get the duct tape duct tape duct tape on standby um, six rolls of duct tape <laughs> yeah the, the, the self awareness I think of how they knew it was going to be difficult for them to go on board and not criticise people 
Yeah. I think that was quite enjoyable. Some of the... Oh, and Crichton, uh, this mechanoid is reversing. Beep. Beep. Yes. Yes. That was a brilliant little moment in itself. Nothing to do with the episode or the plot, of course, but just as a thing that they hadn't done it before. And I'm kind of surprised they hadn't done it before because it's just such an obvious gag. Yeah. I think one other thing which um, is not exactly a negative point, but it bothered me slightly, was we all know that Rimmer's kind of um, anally retentative. Um, But Kat's always been the one who's been taken for being, you know, the dumb one. And when Rimmer was explaining, um, Crichton was explaining to Rimmer about the the, the wave itself. Ah, uh, um, yeah, it sounded it like a conversation with Cat. Would normally be Cat's text. Yeah, that's a very good point. It did sound a lot like a conversation that Cat would be having with Crichton. Yeah. Yeah, I think there were there were some few weird moments in this, mixed in with some little bits of genius and. Uh, Obviously, a, a a pretty I think most people would agree pretty stellar performance from Johnny Vegas. Uh, what did you think of the guest cast overall? We had Johnny Johnny Vegas was the crit cop. We had Jamie Chapman as Ziggy, Paul Leonard as Guru, uh, Arm, Armrita I can't say her name. <gasps> Armrita Acharya as the waitress Greta with the roller skates, and Joe Sims as I mentioned as Tut Johnson. Brilliant name. <laughs> Johnny Vegas and Joe Sims, I have to take it there. Yeah, yeah, I um, agree. Just fantastic putting Johnny Vegas in, really. <laughs> yeah, it just the, the way he kept a straight face, I was just waiting for him to burst out laughing or, or something, but there was nothing, and that sort of kept me on edge when I was watching him. Might be good to see the, the, the smeg ups, the outtakes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Of Johnny I Vegas. I mean, apart from anything, you know, his straight-facedness about playing the character. But um, Sims, I thought, like you said earlier, the, the timing on it was absolutely perfect. And it's just being wheeled in, like, as you said, like uh, Silence of the Lambs and, and just... And then he turns out to be basically normal. He yeah. just... He, he gets that twist in... It's not exactly a twist, it's kind of, you know, who the character is, but it's twisted within the the episode, and he gets that twist just right. Yeah, I think that it was, I mean, the other guys that were, were there as the cameos were... Well, apart from apart from Ziggy, the, the waitress and so forth were fairly small roles. Um, they they were quite, quite fun, but they were fairly um, exaggerated kind of caricature roles. Ziggy, I... Yeah, it was... I wasn't sure about Ziggy as the captain. I think I almost would have preferred a captain that regretted putting the law in place and was actually completely sensible and and grown up and things because you kind of wonder how Ziggy was ever the captain before the rule was in place. Yeah. Because you wouldn't normally get to that position being the way he is. Yeah, except for you, there is a couple of gags in um, Back in the Red where they say that um, basically you bribe sleep and um, blackmail your way to the top. And um... Yes, because Captain Hollister is really just the donut boy. Yes, that's the one. So, I mean, but for that he would have to be a quite a conniving character and he seems far more like a, a, a whimsical, happy-go-lucky, very uh, going for a, like more of a irritating but lovable character so it's not really plausible that someone in that incompetent would have made it to the top yeah exactly it's almost like they needed to imply that they'd been like it for generations or um something had got into the water supply yeah i think that would definitely be more plausible that somehow they'd all been infested by some virus that had knock out their ability to be able to be nasty. Yeah, like a, some kind of engineered, like we had the luck virus and things, maybe something that was a kind of someone's Such attempt to make something. yeah, someone, maybe someone was trying to make humanity nicer and they made, made a niceness virus and that's how it had come out or something like that. Yeah. I think that would have been an interesting approach where, you know, we could have seen 
then maybe the the boys could have got infected if it temporarily themselves it might have been quite funny to have seen a a, a rimmer who was infected with such a virus that made him you know un, unlikely to criticize and happy go lucky and free and things like that because we idea for uh, series 13 here <laughs> yeah well we saw him you know he kind of wanted to stay as a mechanoid um yes and then maybe he would have wanted to have stayed like that um it would have been another angle to his character and you could have still could have pulled out the inner critic and had that part but we could have had a, another we could have had the other side to river a little bit more i mean it's going even more confidence and paranoia then but i think it would have been nice to have seen rimmer happy for an episode yeah. i'd have been frightened to see rimmer <laughs> like that <laughs> What were Sorry. your, what were your guys' views on a uh, planet Rimmer, and Sunny Rim? So full of gas. <laughs> oh, well, I just went about laughing. <laughs> and his hey. main concern just being for the safety of his planet. Yes. <laughs> who, who, who cares about saving us? Is Planet Rimmer going to be okay? <laughs> No, well, he's still concerned with the wealth you would get, which I think is very in keeping for him. He still wants to claim it for the Space Corps and he still wants the wealth that that sand apparently is. Helium 3 or something, wasn't it? Uh, Helium 7. Helium 7, oh, sorry, way beyond 3. <laughs> Helium 3 is for, you know, for, for it's what you buy in the equivalent of Primark. Helium 7 is obviously the Gucci of um, sand. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> So, yeah, would you want a planet named after yourselves? What would you call it? Oh, wow. Um, oh, God. Um, <laughs> yeah, absolutely no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's an unexpected question. Yeah. It is. It's not even on the list. I just made it up. <laughs> It's a curveball. It's a curveball. I'm not sure if I'd want a planet named after me. What if it was rubbish? You know, what if something happened to it and it became really rubbish later? Or, or you know, some aliens what, what came and... <laughs> what if you had a planet named after you, then aliens came down and used it as it's like their like rubbish dump or uh, their base of blowing up the rest of us? Um, I'd change my name. Oh, yeah, you could do. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a workaround I hadn't thought of. Or maybe there will be a planet Bex then. Planet Bex, um, lots of trees, uh, populated entirely by cats. No, they need something to eat. Populated entirely by cats and people that work at whiskers it's factories. <laughs> cats, <and> lollipops. <laughs> cats, lollipops, and a whiskers factory that ships yeah. in cat food. <laughs> um, Teach them to make their own whiskers. Land of eternal kittens, something like that. Oh, sounds fun. There yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. That, that would yeah, be... Anybody, anybody who uh, criticises too much gets sent there to be cuddled to death by kids. <laughs> That's how you cure criticism. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> there you go. My planet will cause universe peace. Possibly. Unless you're allergic to cats. Hmm. Maybe it's Ouch. a bad idea. Maybe it's a bad idea. Scrap it. I'll go, I'll go back to not having a planet. It sounds like too, way too much responsibility. I can barely take care of my house. I've got enough hoovering to do just here. I, I'm not sure if I could take care of an entire planet. Oh, why not? You're getting an industrial, industrial strength vacuum cleaner. <laughs> you think that's what it is? It's just planet kittens and Dyson? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> not instead of, you know, Rimmer yeah, World dwarf, or Planet Rimmer. Red, red dwarf sized vacuum cleaner. Oh, what would happen to my kittens? No, this, this is all getting far too dangerous. I'm, I'm not sure about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is why Rimmer has a planet, and I don't. Yeah, because he uh, keeps things simple. He yeah. just wants to mine it to, mine it to smeg. <laughs> that's probably exactly what he said. I think that's that's got to be a direct quote. <laughs> I'm just asking for one hour. Yeah, he just okay. needed to take some bigger Stay! like shoes to fill, didn't he, or something? Uh, I think one of the other great bits of this one was um, the uh, the Space Corps directive. I can't remember the number, which he ended with "Shut up, Crichton." Yes. 
Roma had some quite good lines in this, it has to be said. Definitely. There's, uh, it's, it's, you know, you're always waiting for Crichton to turn around and say, this, that and the other directives, sir. Are you quite sure? Are you quite sure? The one about the allowance of baked beans per person in times of a nuclear crisis. <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, I like the way he worked it straight into the line without even a... There was no breath there. That that was quite good. Um, yes. Yeah, there that's were some good way. bits. They just would have worked in any episode. I think that's what I think about a lot of things I liked in this one. They were aspects that could have worked in any other episode rather than the things necessarily specific to this one. Yes. Hmm. Yeah, it's definitely... Um. Yeah, ironically had a lot of criticism this episode. I think perhaps... Um, the last episode set the bar very high. I think I think it's also to do with uh, the fact that this episode was very over the top, intentionally, of course. But there's, there's going to be a lot of fans out there who think that it's just too far out there. Yeah, there's there's definitely been some talk that it was a little too pantomime and that they seem to be using slightly outdated stereotypes... Uh, for camp people, um, as I think, but I think they were going for that psychedelia imagery and things. Um, so that sort of, you know, started looking like the covers on sort of like um, uh, some of the Beatles kind of stuff yeah. with the outfits and things. Um, but just obviously needed a few more things to cement it as that rather than being interpreted in in different ways. And I think the the cat should have had more to say about the fashion as well. Definitely, there wasn't a single line. Mm. He bit his tongue very well. So yeah, oh, I, I'm sad that this one is is not quite up to the standard that the um, episodes we've had before it have been. But the episodes that we will be talking about after um, are also, you know, incredibly, incredibly good. So if this is honestly the worst this series has to offer us, it's really not too bad, I would say. Yeah, I mean, they, they it seem, was... sorry, sorry, I was just going to say they seem to do that. I've noticed they go they go from doing sort of a normal um, episode and then they kind of go whoa, way over the top and then sort of tone it back down again and I've noticed that. Hmm. There'll be something that everyone loves. I mean, there'll probably be people that feel this is the, the best episode of the series and then there'll be others that, that think it's the worst. I guess they're just uh, covering all the different aspects that the the Red Dwarf show has to offer. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, definitely a mix of this one, I think. Enjoyable, but maybe too much. I think it's definitely going to split the fans down the middle anyway. Yeah, a divisive one. The most criticised anti-criticism episode ever. I, don't, I, need to, I needed to write some more funny lines about criticism. <laughs> I did read that the name of the ship, the SS um, Enconium, is, a, is a, a Latin word, I think, that means something that praises highly. So I thought okay. that was that was quite a good gag. I think they needed um, some more bits like that in there because that that to me was actually quite is quite a good touch that I hadn't realised at the time. Um, it's like one of one of the Easter eggs that doesn't fall until like uh, two or three years later. Until I read it on somebody else's blog. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I I probably should have spotted it. I did I did languages when I was younger, but apparently. I did not in this case, uh, but it, yeah, I think some of those bits were were actually were actually pretty good and quite quite interesting little touches and things that they had in there. Um, and I think they could have made slightly more of the callbacks to the confidence and paranoia things and and those kind of bits and maybe made this feel a little bit more grounded in the rest of the series. Yeah, I mean, there was there's way too little reference to uh, things that have gone by. Yeah, especially called Time Wave, and we've had so many time travel episodes and things to do with the effects of time time travel. Exactly, and I mean, none of them are getting younger in the ship, of course, so it would be all the more reason for them to try and find something to get them back to Earth rather than just... Uh, or just make, along, make just friends. That was a ship with quite a few people, and if any of them ever, you know, wanted to do anything non-imaginary in the uh, procreating department, making friends with that ship probably would have been a good move. It would have also been one of Cat's prerogatives to 
go and find somebody. I, I think he probably Most couldn't nurses. because they were too badly dressed. No, no female. Yeah. Well, probably. <laughs> this is Cat. He wouldn't care. I'm not sure. When it comes to fashion sense, that might actually trump everything. Even the imperative to uh, to reproduce might be out trumped by the fact that poor fashion sense was in order. And it'd be interesting to know as well, like if because they they'd started to repair everything at the end of that episode and get their engineers back into the engineering department. They didn't actually explain whether or not the engineers did repair it before the criticism rule was taken away and the hairdressers went back to being in charge of the uh, engines. And whether or not they are, they, they were actually going to crash. Well, at the very end of the episode, you do see that their ship is uh, flying away from the mm. planet. But we don't know what is gonna what's happened to it after that point. It could have just crashed into something slightly more inert straight after. Yes. They've left it a bit open. Um, also, I think it would have been nice for them to uh, if 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 they'd been like. This is a question for you. <laughs> if they'd had five more minutes on the episode, what would you have liked them to have done? Ooh, I I think that it would have been better if the ship had either gone massively the other way and become a, a ship of too much criticism, and then they'd legged it and abandoned them. It would have been nice to, I think, I mean, I think just to open the future opportunity if they'd have actually um, maybe installed uh, a hyper, an FTL drive um, in Starbuck. Yeah, because they've so had, Starbuck they had a drive and they lost the drive. Yeah. Yeah. So that Starbuck could effectively get home, but they wouldn't be able to take Red Dwarf with them. Oh, I see. Like a road trip. Kind of thing. Oh, that's a good idea. They've got more than one Starbuck. Yeah. So yeah, because they did... was equipped with an FTL, but nothing else was. They could they could do quite quite a bit with that, I think. Yeah, that could have been interesting because we've got obviously Red Dwarf has has had things at some points, but everything got reset with the nanobots back to factory setting, so it would have lost a lot of those additional features again. Uh, although the timelines are all slightly peculiar now with these things and I forget what Red Dwarf has and hasn't got but the idea that Starbuck was a massive road trip that could have been yeah that could have been a cool series like motivation yeah yeah I, I like the sound of that I have to say uh, okay so this has been a, in a weird one but do you want to rate the episode out of five I'm like three yeah what about you, Matt? Good three and a half. Three point five. Three point five. Yeah, I think I'm I'm around the the same area. And I think for the one of the things that made me think, I think, with seeing Johnny Vegas and seeing some of the um the deadpan stuff in it is I think I want an episode of Simon Pegg. Oh yes. Oh my god, that'd be amazing. I think that's that's what I've taken from this is that if you you got Johnny Vegas in this, I think the next one they need is Simon Pegg. I just I just watched um, Hot Fuzz this week, uh, and that's brilliant. he would be a perfect a perfect fit, I think. And and if they were yeah, maybe they were stuck on a road trip and they got abandoned at a an outpost somewhere trying to get supplies, and the person in charge of it was Simon Pegg. That that maybe if they can prize him away from being incredibly famous in Hollywood, I th- I think he'd like to be on the show. Definitely. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, thank- some, somebody else that they'd probably be able to get if they asked would be uh, Sir Patrick Stewart. That would be amazing. Because he is a massive Red Dwarf fan. And just, just anything he touches is gold as well. So Yes. That would be amazing. Oh, I have a wish list now. We'll have to uh, write to Dave and uh, say, please, 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 many times. As many times as you wrote I am fish on the uh, Skype chat earlier. <laughs> that That is how many pleases we shall send them. I shall have to send one to, uh, to Rob as well. Yes, absolutely. 
Right, guys. Well, thank you very much for coming on this episode with me. Uh, it's been a thank weird episode, but I, I think there were definitely some good points in there. And even if this is the, the lowest point of the series, it's really not that po bad a point to have gone down to. And obviously, I mean, I've already seen the next two episodes. And if you haven't seen those yet, they are absolutely amazing. <coughs> and on that bombshell. <laughs> Yes, uh, it was great to talk to you guys. Take care, and I'll speak to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening, guys. To listen to more Smegcast podcasts from Red Dwarf TV, please subscribe to our Red Dwarf TV YouTube channel and click the bell. Thank you.